it's my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker, uh, Timothy Gath and Ash, who actually doesn't know, need any introduction to uh, anyone who follows historia, historians. Uh, I'm sure that most of us have read his uh, books and followed his uh, comments uh, uh, and uh, columns in the New York Review of Books, uh, The Guardian, New York Times, Financial Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. Um, I will only take uh, one item from his CV, which is that he mentions that he and his wife uh, live mostly in Oxford, uh, though also in Stanford, and airplanes. I think the airplane bit has been perhaps curtailed somewhat by the uh, pandemic situation, but it is an indication that uh, uh, Timothy is a very international uh, figure uh, in, uh, uh, for uh, historians. And we are very happy to welcome you uh, and uh, looking forward to hearing your uh, uh, introduction on the subject of the direction of European history, past and future of an illusion. And uh, everyone can put your comments and questions also using the chat function here uh, on the net. But if you want to um, ask a question, you can raise your hand uh, and uh, I will give you the floor uh, when we come to that. So we will use the first part of this meeting to hear uh, Timothy Gatton Ash's um, presentation. And therefore, and after we will have a possibility for uh, questions, comments, and answers. So, Timothy, please, the floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. And, you, can and, you, you can, and now you can see me as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Aki. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. And I think that entry should now read instead of in airplanes in Zoom, because like everyone else, I seem to spend most of my life online. Um, what I want to do, I'm working on a history of contemporary Europe, and I want to share with you uh, a, an issue um, from this work in progress, which I think is a very interesting one, um, which is how... I mean, to put it in the simplest way, how historians of Europe end their histories of Europe. As you may imagine, I read 50 other histories of Europe, and they all have a problem with how to end. And this connects to my subject of how you think about the direction of European history. So let me just start by giving you a few examples of how people, authors of quite celebrated histories of modern Europe do end. Um, Norman Davies, famous, massive history published in 1996, ends by describing one day, the day he finished the book, 14th of February 1992, telling us in perhaps rather more detail than we want to hear what he's doing on that day. The desk beside the window of the top studio is dimly lit by the dawn, clouds amble over the dark skyline, the leafless apple trees of the old Thorncliff or orchard a solitary crow stands sentinel on the tip of the highest beach. Um, and then tells us in great deal of what was happening in Europe on this day. Not, I think, a very satisfactory way to end a history of Europe. Probably anything else, it was only published four years later. So that day seemed particularly irrelevant. Brendan Sims, Europe, the Struggle for Supremacy, 1453 to the Present. Excellent book again. His solution is to end with a series of questions. But that's not a great solution either, because his questions include the following. He says, only two countries have the power to um, really bring the European Union to function well. And he says, will they, uh, Britain and Germany, will they turn the key together? And then I quote, will Britain serve as the pressure of the European project driving forward security integration and providing it with the military credibility it so desperately needs? Well, I think that question has been answered by history. So turning it into questions doesn't help very well either. William Hitchcock, The Struggle for Europe, another excellent uh, history of post-1945 Europe. He has a different solution. 
he ends not with a prophecy or with a moment of Name, but with an exhortation. Rather, Europe must find a better way of mobilizing its people. Is Europe, after a century filled with war, genocide and fascism, prepared now to advance the ideals of democracy, tolerance, equality and unity? If so, then the people of this continent must be willing to fight for them. So that's the third way of doing it, which is exhortation. David Reynolds, in his concluding chapter of the Oxford Illustrated History of Modern Europe, edited by TCW Blanning, concludes as follows. To a degree unimaginable to Bismarck, Europe in the 1990s was more than a geographical expression. But no less than in the days of Bonaparte or Hitler, European unity remained an idea and not a reality. And reality was the product of history. Which, of course, says absolutely nothing at all. History is a product of reality, and reality is a product of history. So that's actually a cop-out. Ian Kershaw, at the end of his also excellent, which I commend to you, Penguin History of um, uh, Modern Europe, uh, the latest volume, Roller Coaster, covering the period 1950 to 2017, ends as follows. What will happen in the decades to come is impossible to know. The only certainty is uncertainty. Insecurity will remain a hallmark of modern life. Europe's dips and turns, the ups and downs that have characterized its history are sure to continue, which again tells you absolute nothing. It's a complete cop-out. So there are many unsatisfactory ways of ending histories of modern Europe. As I look a bit more deeply into this and look at those which attempt to say something about the direction of European history, I identify and I wanted to share with you briefly four fallacies that it seems to be important to avoid. They are the fallacy of teleology, the fallacy of retrospective determinism, the fallacy of presentism, and the fallacy of extrapolation. Take those quickly in turn. You're all familiar with the history of Europe retold as teleology, in which its ultimate goal is to achieve the ever closer union of the European Union. My favorite example of such a book is the Belgian journalist Christine Ockrans, actually a children's book, uh, the title of which in the, in the German edition is How Julius Caesar Invented the Euro. How Julius Caesar Invented the Euro. Um, but this is, of course, quite widespread. Many of you will know the volume by Jean-Baptiste du Rossel, published in many European languages in the early 1990s. And um, the mastermind of that volume was a man called Frédéric Delouche, well known to some of you, who also organized an illustrated history of modern Europe, published, I think, in 18 languages. And the conclusion to that is to the Duracell, it's actually a, an epilogue written jointly by Delouche and Duracell. But we need not end on so pessimistic a note. The strengths that grace every nation of Europe can only increase as they unite. And developments in the new Central Europe will surely reinforce that trend. European unity, listen carefully, when it comes, not if it comes, when it comes, will be of a new kind, evolving as it progresses. So this is European history retold as teleology. Um, rather in the spirit of Hegel. And what, of course, it is, it's a version of what we know very well from nationalist histories of the nation state, retold at the European level, right? So instead of the glorious end of history being the Wilhelmine Reich or Victorian England or Finland or Sweden, it is the, 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 the European Union. Um, a, 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 a form of narrative which, of course, is actually very familiar from the rhetoric of many leaders of the European Union. 
If you look at the acceptance speeches when the European Union won the Nobel Peace Prize, you will see that. Um, apart from the obvious point that history has no goal, history is not a theodicy, one of the effects of this is to occlude or minimize those very significant parts of recent European history that don't fit into the master narrative. So the obvious example would be, imagine you were sitting in Sarajevo in 1994, and you read the books by Duracell or Deluge. Um, you can imagine what you would think. So that's, I think I have some, somebody who hasn't muted their mic, because I'm getting some feedback. Has everyone f muted their mic? Yeah, OK. Um, so the second um, fallacy is the fallacy of retrospective determinism. This is a term I take from Henri Bergson, who talked about the illusions of retrospective determinism. Although interestingly enough, the term, the illusion of retrospection, actually comes already in Tolstoy's War and Peace, when he's reflecting on the philosophy of history. This is the almost irresistible temptation to write history as if what actually happened somehow had to happen, was bound to happen. So it's related to teleology, but not precisely teleology. The classic example of this is something which has played an important part in my own life, both personally and professionally, 1989. The peaceful revolutions of 1989, the end of the division of Europe and the end of the Cold War. Almost every history book ever written since tells the story of Central and Eastern Europe as if it was heading towards 1989. It singles out those features of developments. For example, the financial problems of the GDR, quote unquote, bankrupt, which pointed to and seemed to lead towards 1989. And the point here is that actually, if you look at it, um, the road that led us to the peaceful end of a nuclear armed uh, 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 totalitarian or post-totalitarian empire with barely a shot fired in anger was not the main road of history through the 1970s and 1980s. It was actually a quite exceptional route, a very unlikely route, um, away from the main road in many respects. That is to say, a whole series of things happened, had to happen in order to make it possible which were intrinsically unlikely or fortunate contingencies. Um, starting very obviously with the phenomenon of Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, a most unlikely, almost miraculous figure to emerge in the leadership of the Soviet Union. Um, but then going on through all a whole series of events, through 1988, 1989, the way in which the transitions played out in Poland, in Hungary, elsewhere in East Central Europe, um, uh, uh, which meant that while the light, the traffic light remained at green from Moscow, change was actually going further and faster than even Gorbachev anticipated or was entirely happy with all the way to October the 7th in Leipzig, where, let me remind you, we were within a hair's breadth of a, of a European Tiananmen, of a violent crackdown. And then finally, of course, to the 9th of November. At any point until, and indeed arguably after the 9th of November, if we had had a Soviet crackdown, then the entire history of Europe post-89, or indeed if the Soviet coup had come before the unification of Germany, we would have had an entirely different uh, history of, of, of modern Europe. And I would argue it's entirely plausible to imagine a, a Europe in which um, there would still be a Soviet empire, a Soviet bloc, very much in decay, but, but still there. 
the weaker version of the illusions of retrospective determinism is what David Hackett Fisher in this wonderful book, which I commend to all of you, if you don't know it, Historians' Fallacies, terrific book from 1970, um, calls the fallacy of presentism. And that is, as he expresses it rather nicely, if at some point in the past you have phenomena A, B, C, D, E, and F, and in the present you have phenomena E, F, G, H, I, what the historian is does is only to focus on phenomenon D, E, F, present now and then, ignoring or very much understating A, B, C, present then, but not present now. And I think that's an important point. I touched on it already. I myself very much like Norman Davies' book, Vanished Kingdoms, because it prays potentially precisely to the dead ends of the past, which we shouldn't, I think, ignore. Last but not least, the fallacy of extrapolation. Um, potentially perhaps the most important of these fallacies. Interestingly enough, even David Hackett Fisher, in a book entirely devoted to historians' fallacies, does not quite avoid the fallacy of extrapolation. On the penultimate page of this book, published in 1970, he says, responsible and informed observers have estimated that by the 1990s, as many as 48 nations may possess nuclear weapons, and then goes on to give us a lecture about the responsibility of historians in the light of this prediction, extrapolation by responsible and informed observers, 48 nations by the 1990s. Now, it's very interesting, again, that if you look at the concluding pages of what historians of modern Europe do, even the best and most skeptical of them, such as Tony Judd, who produced that magnificent book post-war, in my view, along with Mark Mazur's Dark Continent, two of the best histories of, of, of post-1945 Europe, published in Tony Judd, publishing in 2005, ends as follows. Um, he talks about the relative strength of Europe versus America and China, he says, America would have the biggest army and China would make more and cheaper goods. But neither America nor China had a serviceable model to propose for universal emulation. In spite of the horrors of their recent past and in large measure because of them, it was Europeans who were now uniquely placed to offer the world some modest advice on how to avoid repeating their own mistakes. Few would have predicted it 60 years before, but the 21st century might yet belong to Europe. Cautious, skeptical Tony Jazz, the 21st century might yet belong to Europe. Very hard to imagine a history of modern Europe written today which would have any such, however speculative, optimistic extrapolation. And let me make one point here, which is, if I had read you a whole series of quotations which were anonymized, I think you might have had great difficulty in identifying the author. For example, I doubt very much whether you'd have identified that with Tony Judd. But what would have been easier to guess would have been the date because virtually every European history written between the early 1990s and the early to mid 2000s has an essentially a largely optimistic tone to it. So it's an illustration of the old and familiar point about how much historians are influenced by the zeitgeist, by the spirit of their own times, even the best and most skeptical of them. What do I take away from this? Um, well, let me just give you two thoughts, two possible takeaways, and then throw it open for the discussion. The first is that I think this shows us 
the importance of counterfactuals, of historians taking seriously what I would call realistic counterfactuals. In other words, those that explore real possibilities that were there in Europe at a given time. I've already hinted at one, which is a counterfactual of someone other than Gorbachev succeeding to the Soviet leadership in 1985, and thinking through carefully what that might have looked like. Um, my Stanford colleague, Walter Scheider's book, Escape from Rome, which some of you will know, is a very good example of how useful and illuminating it is to use carefully uh, counterfactuals. So that, I think, is, is, is one important lesson. A second takeaway for me is that actually I don't think it's so useful for historians to speculate however cautiously about directions of European history. But what I do think is useful is for them to point to patterns or recurrent issues through European history which are relevant to and from which we can draw lessons for the present. Um, at the very simplest, the lesson that no empire, commonwealth, alliance, entente or union has ever lasted forever, right? So that the mistake made by so many colleagues in the field of Sovietology was to work within an in-system paradigm rather than allowing for the possibility of change of system. And coming to the history of the Soviet bloc as a historian, it was a great asset to know that very elementary fact. But of course, if we then think of the European Union in that context, then we have to say immediately that while no empire lasts forever, and by the way, I think the EU can perfectly well be described as an empire in the sense of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, empires have lasted for very different periods of time. The obvious contrast here is between the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Third Reich. The Third Reich lasting for less than 13 years, the First Reich lasting for just over a thousand years. And then one wants to ask, so why did the Holy Roman Empire succeed in lasting so long? And this brings me to what seems to me an absolutely crucial pattern. It's a pattern that Mark Mazoa touches on in the conclusion to his book. It's a pattern that Andreas Wirsching, in his Preis der Freiheit, a really excellent history of Europe, majors on, which is the very familiar issue of combining unity and diversity. That seems to me a pattern that goes deep through the whole of your modern European history and indeed even pre-modern European history. It runs through the whole history of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, Wirsching, being a touch too Hegelian for me, talks about it as a dialectic between unity and diversity, a dialectical process uh, so that his very stimulating last section of his book um, uh, ends with the sentence, the crisis of Europe is its growing together. It's the growing together that causes the crisis. It's the crisis that precipitates its going to, growing together. A bit too Hegelian for me, but the lesson that I would want to draw, and it's an illustration of how I think one can usefully draw lessons, not about directions, but about patterns, is that European constructions, political constructions of all kinds, have struggled throughout European history with this dilemma of unity and diversity. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire is actually, in my view, the polity that came close to striking the right balance between unity and diversity, having on the one hand a shared mystique, but on the other hand, great flexibility, allowing for local and regional, uh, great local and regional variations. My colleague Peter Wilson 
writes about this very well in his book, Heart of Europe. And so the challenge that I think we draw from history is to keep trying to strike that balance between unity and diversity. And a lesson seems to me to be that if you push too hard for unity, you will get a correction back in the direction of diversity. If you allow too much diversity, then sooner or later, there will become a countervailing trend to unity. Anyway, that is my opening thought. Think more about patterns, less about directions of European history. I look forward to the conversation. Oh, thank you very much. Um, first, of, first of all, I would like uh, those who are not speaking to close their cameras and microphones because uh, uh, you may not want to have, have, have us look at your coffee drinking or whatever. But nevertheless, please keep your cameras closed when you are not speaking. And I see there are quite a few cameras now open, so please close them. Um, and then I will open the floor for, for comments, questions, uh, discussion. I'm sure that uh, this presentation uh, gave the impetus for many questions and many, many comments. Um, I don't see any hands as yet uh, or anyone on the chat uh, asking uh, for the floor, but please uh, do so uh, and you will be uh, given the floor. But meanwhile, uh, before, unless somebody is asking for the floor, um, I would like to say that uh, that uh, originally uh, when we contacted uh, Timothy uh, in Oxford, we proposed uh, discussing, uh, given the situation we have in Europe where we see a rise of nationalism, how this has affected uh, historical views and historians work, uh, and uh, particularly, of course, Brexit Britain is a um, very interesting case, to say the least. Uh, what, what, what effect it will have on, on history, and um, uh, perhaps you could also elaborate some, some words on, on this, because this, I think, is very interesting. We see this rise of nationalism, and we saw that, that this was also behind the uh, Brexit vote uh, uh, that uh, people were thinking the UK first or England first. I don't th think they were speaking for Scotland so much or, or for Ireland, but but uh, this, yeah. uh, this this is an interesting question. So from a particular UK or British point of view, uh, how has Brexit affected uh, your thinking on uh, history and how history is being used in the political debate today? Um, a couple of comments, Eki. First of all, um, the way Brexit has been explained, uh, both in Britain and in continental Europe, is a classic example of Bergson's illusions of retrospective determinism. Because most accounts now go in the direction that Europe, uh, Britain was already heading for the door, right? And there was so much already pointing in that direction and all the factors are accumulated that were pointing in that direction, which seems to me completely ahistorical because the truth is the, the result was extremely close. There were the deep structural reasons, which we all know, but those had been present under Margaret Thatcher, but also under John Major and under Tony Blair. Decisive were the contingent or conjunctural reasons. And if one or two of those finally decisive contingent conjunctural reasons, which made that last difference between 52-48 one way and 52-48 the other, if we had a different leader of the Labour Party, case for Britain's membership in the European Union, um, or if there had been a slightly different deal um, with the EU, or if the vote had come a year later, um, it could well have gone the other way. And then all historians forevermore would be explaining why, after all, British pragmatism had prevailed 
and the sensible Brits decided to stay in the EU. So that's point number one. Point number two, did bad history feed into this? Absolutely yes. You, 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 you probably, many of you know the, the popular version of Ernest Renan's famous remark about a nation and the popular version being that a nation is a group of people united by a shared dislike of their neighbors and a common misunderstanding of their own past. And we were certainly an example of a common misunderstanding of our own past. A very superficial our island story history. Um, Boris Johnson said in coming out for Brexit, um, a country that ruled the greatest empire the world has ever seen is surely capable of making its own trade deals. Well, that doesn't look terribly good at the moment. And so this simplistic, nationalistic, bombastic uh, version, both of our island past, but also particularly of our I imperial past, definitely fed in to the narrative uh, of, of Brexit. And so to that extent, I think it's an example of the dangers of bad history. Um, last point to your question, does it affect the way people are writing this history, hardly at all scholarly history, hardly at all scholarly history, maybe some popular history, but not scholarly history. There are a few exceptions. Robert Toombs, uh, historian at Cambridge, is now almost a sort of the official historian of Brexit and very much pushing the line that, as it were, the act in restraint of appeals from Rome in 1519 predetermined Brexit in 2016. Um, but I think I, I, I think I think not. Much more worrying is the fact that um, the, the 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 in 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 uh, as it were the mental world, the world of discourse, is already diverging quite rapidly from that of the EU 27. So, for example, in most EU 27 countries. Uh, European councils are still an important event. Um, in Britain, nobody notices European councils, except in as much as they're discussing Brexit. So I think we have to fear a, a divergence in our in our national discourse, in our media, um, but much less so, I think, in professional history writing. Thank you. Um, there's one camera open, as Jan Storre, if you close your camera. Uh, please. Uh, and now there's one question, uh, one hand raised, and that is TF. Would you please introduce yourself and uh, open your camera and uh, uh, microphone, and you have the floor, please. Can, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So my name is Antoine Arjakovsky. I am in Paris. I am a historian. And I published in 2016 a history of European consciousness, une histoire de la conscience européenne, uh, in French, and now it's translated in, in English, and I hope it will be published soon. And I wanted to say that I appreciated very much the introduction of Professor Garton Ash, because he pointed on the right uh, uh, problems of uh, writing uh, European history. Um, my question is the following. When I uh, saw your, um, the title of your, your speech, uh, I thought about François Furet, who wrote a book, Le Passé d'une Illusion, <laughs> about the, yeah. the, 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 the fallacy of, uh, of communism, the, the, the end of the communist uh, ideology in the 20th century. So I thought it's, uh, it's, uh, it's rather pessimistic about uh, writing the history of uh, Europe today. And this is why I have a question. Don't you think we need to change our historiography? Because François Furet, who was close to Pierre Nora, François Furet was close to the idea of the place of memories, les lieux de mémoire. And it's not enough to have a, 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 a vision of the future and of the past that would be possible for Europeans today. We tried in our history of European consciousness to focus on a new historiography based by uh, some ideas of Paul Ricoeur, the idea that identity and otherness 
should be uh, united by crossed looks on the past, les regards croisés. So, les regards croisés, the idea of consciousness, and the idea also of participation of European citizens in order to write together with professional historians the history of Europe. Don't you think that will help us to avoid these uh, fallacies that you mentioned, uh, but also to write something in a more positive, uh, uh, optimistic, I would say, uh, understanding on the patterns that you mentioned for Europe? Thank you for a very interesting question. Um, as soon as we finish this webinar, I'm going to go on Amazon and order your book, which I look forward to reading. Um, and I love the notion you take from Paul Ricoeur, whose work I altogether adore, myself as another, reversing the gaze. I think that's a, an excellent um, way to go. Uh, and indeed, the project that we have at Oxford, which I lead, which is called Europe Stories, which you might be interested in. At the moment, we're looking at how Europeans inside Europe, still including the British, um, see Europe. But the next stage of the project is going to reverse the gaze and have the view from outside, from our wider neighborhood, which I think is enormously <laughs> illuminating. <laughs> um, whether that will lead us to be more optimistic is another question. I think somebody maybe has a mic on. Uh, whether that will lead us to be more optimistic is another question, um, because actually the view you get from outside uh, is often extremely critical, both because it's a post-colonial view, so they've had a very different experience of European civilization and European universalism, but also, for example, uh, if you talk to Chinese or people from Turkey or Russians, they often say your wonderful freedom of movement inside Europe is bought at the cost of our lack of freedom of movement, the extreme difficulty for us to come into Europe. Um, but, but I think that's a great way to go. As I say, I don't think it'll be so optimistic. But... My other point I'd like to make to you is, in a sense, we are suffering in Europe almost from a, a surfeit of what, of what the Germans called Zweck Optimismus, which can also be seen as wishful thinking. That's to say, the rhetoric that we get from European leaders, particularly from Brussels, is always almost of a Whig interpretation of European history, from war to peace. Um, whereas if you look at the personal motivations for three generations of Europeans since 1945, who drove forward the European project all the way from the founding fathers after the Second World War to the 1990s, early 2000s, it was always, we have been in a bad place. We know how bad Europe can be. We want to be in a better one, and we're going to call that place Europe. So the driving force came out of the experience of much darker places, of evil, if you will, of the worst sides of European history. And I think one of the problems we have at the moment is that we have in much, not all, but much of Europe, a younger generation of Europeans, uh, born since 1989, who broadly speaking have only known a Europe which is relatively peaceful, prosperous, and free. And so they don't have that deep driving motivation, motivation that comes from personal experience of a much worse Europe. So our job as historians, in my view, is also to bring home to them just how let me use the word, barbaric Europe has been, even within living memory, let me mention former Yugoslavia, and how close, close we always are to falling back to that. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment or anyone on the chat either putting questions. Um, so I think that we will be winding this uh, up, uh, but uh, before that, I would like to use the opportunity to ask uh, Timothy Gatunas, um, what 
do you see how do you see the role of historians and historians without borders in particular because historical debates uh, and the misuse of history which we do see everywhere are very very uh, uh, very bad examples of uh, they are not primarily historians they are politicians and the media who misuse history so um, what would be your advice and uh, your uh, hopes for the historical his community of historians how could we uh, have more influence uh, to stop this misuse of history which we see uh, so much in europe and in, in uh, and elsewhere so any any comments and ideas you have for our future work would be very welcome uh, thank you, Erki. Can I connect that to a question that I've just seen has come up on the chat? If I could just read out the question, because it, it relates directly to what you said. Jonathan Dekel Chen says, in light of mobilizations of highly nationalized, distorted histories by authoritarian leaders in East and East Central in recent years, what role can professional historians reasonably play today? in reducing tensions catalyzed by these uses of history, which connects very much to your question. And, and let me first of all agree with the premise that in a few countries, only a few countries in Europe, we really do have a reversion to authoritarian nationalist manipulations of history. Hungary and Poland being the two examples that I know best. And the point here is, it, it's not just the rhetoric of politicians, it's also the, the infrastructure of museums, of institutes of national memory, uh, control over academic appointments, so that you have to go in a certain direction in your work to have a chance of making a good career, and of course, teaching in schools, crucially. So it's a very serious problem. And um, I, I think that there are a number of things we can do. Um, and by the way, in this context, let me just mention that the way we Europeans, the EU, has allowed the Central European University to be kicked out of Budapest is an absolute scandal without, less, without more protest. Because one of the things we can do is provide institutional frameworks in which the historian of the country concerned can continue to work in the country concerned and on the country concerned. So counterbalancing the institutional frameworks that are pushing history, prejudicing the writing and teaching of history in a certain direction. Um, secondly, I think, and of course we have a long record of this, where, as for example, between Hungary and its neighbors, or between Poland and Lithuania, previously between Poland and Germany, there are particular bilateral issues. I think really intensive bilateral collaborations are very important indeed. And thirdly, you know, there's, there's actually a crisis of the academic teaching of humanities in many universities around the world and within that a particular crisis of the teaching of European history. So I think thinking about ensuring that we have a new generation of historians, for example, of Southeastern Europe or of East Central Europe, who are really well trained in our own countries, uh, who can do really good quality work on the history of these countries and these regions more independently, more neutrally, um, and then bring that into the de debates in those countries, uh, notably by translations, which of course need to be subsidized. Uh, that's the third way in which we can do it. But, but it's, it, it, it's a big, big problem. Last word, if I may, on that point, Aki, and this goes to your own very distinguished political career. I, I really am worried. It, Jean Monnet said in the early 1970s, a dictatorship may exist somewhere in Europe, but a dictatorship inside the European Union, that is impossible. That was the guiding principle, which we all signed up to. And now in Hungary, we have a country which is certainly no longer a 
proper democracy. It's some sort of a hybrid authoritarian regime. And the fact that while we still talk about European values, while they're anchored in uh, Article 2 of the treaty, while we talk about the normative power of the European Union, Viktor Orban can still be taking billions of European taxpayers' money to use pretty largely as he sees fit, while violating these values, including in the distortion of history. You know, look at what happens in the respect of the Treaty of Chernobyl, for example, and relations with Slovakia. Um, I think that's a real challenge to the European project. And I think we as historians should also be trying, constantly reminding European leaders of that. I see there's someone else on the chat too. Thank you. Uh, and Martin Brown has a question, please. Uh, hopefully you can you can see me now. I can indeed. And, and hear me. I do apologize. I've just come back from the dentist. So if my mouth is slightly wonky, I do apologize. I'm sat here in Tallinn, Estonia. So at the furthest edge of the European Union. And listening to, and thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. One one thing I'd like to try and narrow down a little is is, is a bit more about a taxonomy of, of history. Because in fact, what you've mentioned through this talk is a wide array of different approaches from history, from professionals at Oxbridge, for example, academics like myself, historians, um, all the way through to populist politicians. Uh, to schools, to museums. There's a wide array of vehicles which disseminate history. And certainly with my own students, undergraduates, and indeed with graduates, increasingly, I don't think they're starting out by reading academic historians. Um, they may, hopefully, you, you, you get to read them, you, you push them in the right direction, but they're not getting their history from academic textbooks or, or, or scholarly monographs. They're getting their history from TV, film, good, bad and indifferent, right? Um, the internet increasingly, Wikipedia. And I think as professional historians who are interested in communicating history um, and also seems to be an undercurrent here of challenging history in good ways and bad ways. I was interested in good history and bad history. Plenty of both here in Estonia, I hasten to add. Um, how would we break this down? Is there some sort of taxonomy in mind? I mean, as historians, we're, we're told now more and more about impact. You've got to have impact. It's no good that you just write a journal article or a book. You've got to have impact. You can't sit in your ivory tower. So is there any way that you could come up with some sort of um, breakdown of that? Because it strikes me as increasingly complicated. So um, what I was thinking about mainly was professional or at least, uh, if not strictly academic, um, highly qualified general historians writing histories of Europe. That's what I think about because I'm writing a history of contemporary Europe, which by the way, of course, I hope will be read by many, many millions of people in lots of languages, as one always does. Um, because obviously writing for a general reader, trying to bring it home, writing vividly with personal illustrations is very important. So I continue to believe, and by the way, I think that books like Mark Mazur's and Tony Jantz have actually had a really significant, I mean, so Tony Jantz was a great friend of mine. He died, as you know, tragically young, but I'm really moved by how often it's still referred to. So I, I still think a good general history can have an impact. But you're absolutely right. People are getting their knowledge in other ways. And if I can connect this to a question, Erki, because it's on the chat from Thomas Gatehouse, which is about teaching in schools. So my answer to your question would be, number one, we need more history in schools. Our pupils now need to know about three different areas of history. They need to know about their national history still. They need to know about European history, because that's where we are. And they need to know something of the history of the countries, the very different countries from which their minorities, their growing ethnic and cultural minorities come. And, and to do that seriously, we need just more hours of history teaching in schools. So that's answer number one. Um, answer number two, 
is the the it's actually a problem of our media system which is this i know from my work on on free speech and media there have been endless attempts to do european wide media right and most of them only reach a tiny audience i've made such attempts myself i am making such an attempt with this project they reach a tiny audience normally of the converted whereas a soap opera holocaust changed the whole west german view of their own history so it's it's what we're looking for is almost the pan european soap opera so maybe that could be your next your next project thank you there's also a comment on the chat about uh, suggesting that professional historians should contribute more um, also on the wikipedia which is open for everyone for us and i uh, I think that's a good suggestion. I think we we should be more active also uh, using uh, these these fora as well. Um, but thank you, thank you all for participating, and thank you, uh, Timothy, for uh, your inspiring uh, talks. I hope that we can keep in in contact, and I'm very much looking forward to the next occasion when we can speak face to face. These are only second best these webinars. They are wonderful, but they are not. They do not really uh, answer the need that we we, we have. Uh, historians, politicians, we all need to be talking face to face.